We just probably had to grow up quicker. There was periods where you'd go out and you wouldn't get five yards outside the door and there'd be cars pulling over on the street and you go into the pub and everyone is looking at you. One time I went to, stupidly went to Westfield in Shepherd's Bush and honestly swore to God, I was like, I'm gonna die in here. Probably became a bit of a recluse in ways. I don't know if I made a ton of mistakes, but if I did, I did them publicly. The actual moment, you know, uh, 1D comes to an end. Mm. When did you realize that it was over? Hello, and welcome to Unfiltered. My name is Ollie Dugmore, and my guest today is a musician. Born in Mullingar, Ireland in 1993, his life was normal. By the age of 16, he was one of the most famous people in the world. Part of the biggest boy band since the Beatles, One Direction. Reflecting on that moment, he said, My childhood was cut short. I never really got the chance to finish school. After the first audition, I packed up everything in my life in a bag. I didn't realise at the time that, when I was stuffing clothes into a little suitcase, that was pretty much me leaving home for good. His dad says he went to that audition and never came back. My guest today is Niall Horan. How's it going, pal? Hello. Hello, Ollie. Uh, that, was, that was a hell of an intro. You reckon? Yeah, very good. We're off to a cracking start. The vibes are just immaculate. Yeah, I actually, we should just leave it there. <laughs> we'll stop. Job done. Um, what have you been up to? What have you been up to the last few days? How are you keeping? Good, yeah. I just got into Dublin today, doing the, doing the rounds on the promotional run. I've got an album coming out in mm. June, so um, I'm doing all the bits and pieces for that and doing a bit around Europe and... Yeah, just been just been busy gearing up for tour, and I think your sort of headline, well, summer live festival debut is on the way as well. Yeah, I played my first festival ever in uh, May. Big moves. Yeah, and then how are you feeling about it? Good. No, I can't wait because I love a festival myself. Um, I love going to them. I love the idea of like walking past the stage, seeing a band that you've never seen before, half cut. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then convincing that person to stay and listen to your music. Yeah, so that's that's going to be my challenge. Is I, There will be people there that know exactly who I am and w will be fans, I'd imagine, down towards the barrier. And then hopefully the, the idea is to get a few more <laughs> drunken lads on the way to get mm -hmm. a burger or something. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's the aim. And that'll be your third album. I tried to sort of do the numbers on what you've sold since going solo. I could only find the, sort of the American ones are like very reliable, but right. it was like six point six and a half million copies, I think, sold in the States <laughs> since you went solo. Um, really, really impressive. How are you finding the experience of writing your own songs and mm. sort of having that full creative control? I'm guessing really fulfilling. Yeah, it's, 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 an ama it's amazing. Like, um, I, I've got a good record label where I get left to it, so I kind of like I tell them when I'm finished, kind of kind of thing, which is uh, from what I gather quite rare. But I've always been quite lucky. Mm. Um, yeah, I just kind of disappear there for a year, eighteen months, get in the studio, get the head down, and then in October, November last year, I just went, okay, here record label, it's yours now, and then they set it all up and we go for it. But yeah, no, it's exciting. It's a it's an album that I spent a lot of time on. I think you can hear this, you know, when you like, I don't know if you can hear it, but you can tell, I can hear time in some people's records. Like when I listen to music, it's like, they definitely thought about that. They, yeah. they took their time over it. They, they stewed on it. And uh, I feel like I can hear that in, in this stuff. And I'm, I'm really excited for it. Yeah. That's so, brilliant. Yeah. That's brilliant. So as with all of our guests on Unfiltered, this mm -hmm. is a show about how the events of your life made you the person that you are today. Yeah. It seems... Well, let's start. Let's begin at the beginning, which I think is always sensible. Yeah, it's a good, a good, it's a good, good way to go. So, um, born in Mullingar. Yeah. My only common reference point for that is the Rubber Bandit song, <laughs> oh, Horse yeah. Outside, at, at the end. It, it does get references, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, tell me about Mullingar. What's good? Small market type town. Typical, very typical Irish looking town. Um, kind of working class. Um, 30, at the time, there was probably 30, 35,000 people. It's probably a lot bigger now, I'm sure. It's, these towns seem to get wider and wider every time, every year. But, um, yeah, just a very small working class town and smack bang in the middle of Ireland. Um, parents, my mother worked at a Mullingar Pewter, which is like a like a crafts, uh, Irish crafts place. And my dad worked in Tesco for 35 years and... Um, yeah, and then they divorced when I was five, four or five. Mm. Um, and then I kind of jumped between houses and... How was that for you? Because four or five, you're kind of... Can you, well, can you remember it? First yeah, I can, I, can, I can remember it happening, but obviously not really knowing what the hell was going on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think being that young, I kind of 
I didn't know enough about it for for it to affect me. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, or so you think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <Ooh. laughs> yeah, no, I'm I... so affected. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, but it's it's what well, is one of those things. I'm still so young and not like impressionable at that point. Mm. So it's uh, I'm, I'm I'm completely. Good yeah, it happened. It happened to me. My parents split when I was about ten, and so I was more conscious. Yeah. Of kind of the relationship between them and how you can kind of end up, I guess, as a bit of a poor, not saying this happened to me, but you yeah. can kind of, as a child, feel a bit like responsible. And if I make this decision because it's more convenient for me, am I upsetting one of my parents? Exactly. But then as you get older, you kind of become more independent compared to your mates because you're only being surveilled by one adult Correct. In instead of two. <laughs> so you've got to get away with a bit more as well. That's very, very true. Christmas is a tough one. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, it depends, I guess, because yeah. you get two Christmas dinners. Yeah, but jumping between, it's just a pain. Yeah, for I'm sure. I'm going there this year, I'm going there next year. It's like it's a... Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah I was just, Rotors. For, forever pleasing. Mm. But um, yeah, it kind of gotten to the point now where it's just, it just happens. Do you remember... The first time you performed, not necessarily musically, mm. but the first time, the first bit of performance you did. Oh, Christ. Um, yeah, I was probably like this, the, the choir teacher at school in our little, like I went to a primary school of about th two or three hundred kids, tiny little like rural school. And the, there was a woman in there, Anne Caulfield, and she was my, one of my teachers. And she also played piano and did all the choir stuff at Christmas carols and all that stuff. And she kind of heard me sing one day and then had me like sing, you know, solos and some of these little Christmassy things. And then I played, she got me to play Oliver in the production of Oliver Twist uh, when I was about seven. I think it was seven or eight, probably. Um, and that was like my first playing a lead role at that young, uh, in such a big role like Oliver or whatever. So I was, that was probably the first thing I can... Mm really remember and then it was just kind of she would always just kind of put me forward for things you know trying to build confidence to mm -hmm. yeah did a um, good job yeah <laughs> she, she did all right <laughs> didn't she <laughs> she's brilliant i still talk it all to her today awesome um, how were yeah, you at school generally well behaved i was a combination i think it was a bit of a mess or a bit of a class clown but i like a B, C, D student i was never going to like take over the academic world let's put it that way mm -hmm. um but yeah, no, I was I was a mixed bag. Never going to, as I said, never going to take over the academic world. Had a bit of a laugh, enjoyed school, and then, yeah, that was that's the way I was. Yeah, I was a bit of a master. Yeah. So often it is. There's people have a teacher. It could be like I'm thinking probably of Ian Wright. You know, Mr. Pigeon, that mm. PE teacher who sort of like made it for him. How good is that? Yeah, um, that th video when, when they see each other a for the first time. Oh my god, please. It made me cry. That goosebumps now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> He goes, I thought you were dead. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not here. I'm, I'm, I'm here. Um, was your choir teacher, did similar type of role, was that your favourite teacher? Did she, yeah. she, the development you had really left an impact on you? Yeah, probably because our school, any school basically in Ireland is very sports centric, very like Gaelic football, very, you know, yeah, like very bit like a lot based around this. Maybe less so primary school. Primary school is primary school. You know, mm. you're teaching kids how to add, to multiply, and draw a few pictures. Like it's not overcomplicated, but um, not that I'm undermining anything that they did. <laughs> <laughs> they made, they made. No, me. for sure. But you know what I mean. It's yeah, not of course. you know. Um, so you have teachers nurture mm -hmm. at that age, whereas as students of an older age, just annoy mm -hmm. <laughs> teachers. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think she just kind of took me under her wing with a couple of the other lads in in, in our class, and just kind of made me the the singer when everyone else was all sporty and I didn't yeah, really yeah, play yeah. the Gaelic. I was I was too small to play Gaelic football. They were all big and strong, and I was just never grew. Um, <laughs> so I just kind of stuck to the singing. Were your Were your family musical? No, not at all. Light music. Uh, or, yeah, big yeah. music fans. Yeah, like I grew up on a lot of like seventies American rock. Um, you can hear it. Yeah, in your work, yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah, well, that's a good good thing, I suppose. It's kind of a, at this mo at this point, it's like subconsciously kind of I pick up the guitar, and that's what I naturally play. Mm -hmm. You know, and having heard, that's I went to an Eagles concert when I was four. It was like my first gig at the that's RDS. Sick. And I think that was like my intro to music and mm -hmm. like vinyl in the house and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, just yeah, that was they were all both mad into it and had like a ma an amazing vinyl collection. Uh, in the house, so I was, yeah, I was brought up on the good stuff. Still listen to it now, like there's no, it's it's the groundwork for what I do. And your dad as well, in terms of other passions, mm. massive Derby fan, right? Massive Derby County fan, yeah, he's over there every week. Honestly, he's unbelievable, that fella. He, um, 
every, most weekends he's over there. Mm. Um, you go as well. I try, yeah, when I go, yeah, I was there, I was at Oxford United a couple of weeks ago, been down to Portsmouth this season on a Friday night in the freezing cold. <laughs> uh, how, how does a family living in Mullingar yeah. end up going to Pride, well, maybe not Pride Park initially. Baseball ground, yeah. Yeah, back like, then. What's, what's the story there? How does that happen? He, I think when he was, he was born in 60, so 71, 72, he started getting into football, and we had won the league with Brian Clough. And it was at that point, it was literally Derby or Leeds. And he probably would have still been listening to it on the wireless or something and just kind of formed his opinion on English football through mm-hmm. that. And then just whatever money he was making, he was going, trying to get over at least a couple of times a season or whatever. And then it snowballed into a passion where we'd go. There was a period when we were going nearly every weekend. Not awful lot of money, bear in mind. He was like bringing us on, you know, a Tesco wage. And he was mad into it, and then you realise there's a load of Irish people who support Derby, and then it became a bit of like a, you know, the the Irish Rams would turn up at Dublin Airport on a Saturday morning, or for years we went on the ferry. I bet there were some good piss ups there. Oh, great! Yeah, well, I wasn't sadly wasn't involved in any of them when I was that age, but it looked like good crack. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it was uh, it was brilliant. We uh, we used to get like the f- stupid o'clock ferry at like six a.m. from from Dunleary to to Hollyhead and then get the train as the sun was coming up to crew and change of crew and then crew to Derby and then literally at 10 to 5 out the door straight to back onto the train crew the reverse it's extraordinary and it, yeah and, then, and he's still at that now well, obviously then Ryan Air came about <laughs> so it changed the so mechanics changed, have been changed yeah. a little bit East Midlands Airport became became <laughs> the spot and then uh, yeah he's still at it every every other week he was there at the weekend watching us get thumped 2-0 against Forest Green Rovers or something like that so it's not quite it's gone beyond days. football fandom now yeah, it's just yeah, like yeah. Uh, it's a thing masochism mm-hmm. um, your childhood and education was cut short like I said at the top of this mm. Uh, in, in the introduction by One Direction mm. and the X Factor. The bastards. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> God, I really hate those guys yeah, for that. Yeah, yeah, I can't believe they took me out of school. <laughs> um, Rolling Stone call One Direction, and this is a direct cro- mm-hmm. quote, one of the great rock and roll bands of the 21st century. I'll take that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sarcastic. With, 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 yeah, a little bit. Yeah, uh, yeah. With hindsight, obviously, think you can make comments like that but at what point did you sort of sit up and go hang on there's something happening here you know this isn't this isn't what my other 16 year old mates are at yeah it was um god it because it was so quick but gr- uh, gradually quick <laughs> <laughs> it fe- because on. there was no like i can't think of a specific moment but it was like it was like that but mm. when you're in the mix a short period of time feels like a long period yeah, of time. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, and you're in the bubble going along with it. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember just like coming to the, coming to the States, like going to the States for the first time in 2011 or 12 and seeing like the madness for a country we'd never been to before. Yeah. And like, you know, in our head from our neck of the woods, it's America's the thing, isn't it? You know? Mm-hmm. Um, we were seeing it outside the X Factor studio and we were seeing bits around the UK and because you know they know us because we were on their TV screens every Friday night or every Saturday night and then it was just getting to the States and like seeing that madness or going to like it, places like Italy and yeah, and the st- streets being blocked off and like shutting down Times Square and like, <laughs> like you know like mad stuff like, yeah, yeah. that's when you're like what's going on? I think the point you made there on about being on TV as well, because you know when the show was in its peak around then, I think it was getting about fifteen million people watching mm-hmm. it every night, right? So yeah. you go from being a normal teenager, it, it gets broadcast, fifteen million people yeah. all of a sudden know exactly who you are. Yeah. You know they've done the emotional backstory thing, they've built you up, yeah. they've done all that. Yeah. You're going through the show, and by Sunday, you're famous. You know, I guess that's kind of what you mean by quick and gradual. Yeah, yeah. Was it difficult to adjust? Um. Yes and no. Like, the fact that I literally, like, packed a suitcase and never went home. Mm. 14 years later, still the same thing. Um, like, that that was mad. But then again, I'd watched The X Factor for years, I was just, and I was just, like, going along with it. Like, mm. this is brilliant. To meet these new lads, we're having a great time. We're, I was 16 or 17 or something like that. Just being 16 and 17, very impressionable, just going along with things seeing what happens, playing it by ear, having fun, 
making tunes. Like, it was all just happening. And it's I quite, was there. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been, I've been, I was more been than playing there, yourself yeah. down a little bit, yeah. <laughs> um, but I guess it's kind of like a continuation of school, maybe, in a way. But mm. you, 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 like you were saying, making tunes. And yeah, you made some tunes. Five years, five records, mm. four world tours, mm. two of which were arena tours. Mm. The thing that impresses me, one of the things that most impresses me about it is the work ethic mm. yeah. that, that that involves. And actually, at the beginning, you mentioned uh, time. Mm-hmm. You mentioned being able to listen to a record and hear time. Yeah. What was the story with that work ethic? Were mm-hmm. you making hay while the sun shines? You were like, we're having a great time here. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Did you want to be working that hard and that yeah, intensively? It was, it was a, in hindsight, we like, it, that's why you kind of stopped for a second because like, it was just like, all right, we've done a lot here. Mm-hmm. Maybe just like everyone calm down for a second. But it's not so much striking while the iron's hot. It's more the demand is there. Like, you can go, we can go and we can play, like, two years of stadiums, like, which is nuts. And at that point, not a lot. Like, it was U2, basically. And (laughs) there wasn't many, like, people playing stadiums around then. Uh Um, And it was just, the demand was there and it was fun. It was a great laugh. We were just bouncing around the place on a bus, going all over the world, seeing different places, getting up on stage to... Countries that don't even speak the same language as you. And they're singing the words back at you. Yeah, we remember the first, first time we went to South America. We played in Bogota, Colombia, first night. Never been in the place in our lives. Never been to South America. And we played to, to like 50,000 people on the first night. People that don't even speak the same language as you. And they're roaring lyrics back. And I always just find that, like, that's the maddest thing about what we do. But I remember seeing that as well. That was another point where I was like, Christ, this is a different league. This, this is nuts. Yeah. This is serious. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. I mean, that's completely, completely extraordinary. You're saying mm. there, there's a lot of demand. So obviously, you know, a lot of sales. Mm. I'm thinking of myself at that time, yeah. 16, 17, 18 year old me <laughs> <laughs> getting a payday like that. Mm-hmm. And I'd be thinking, well, I'll put it like this. I wouldn't be buying premium bonds. I'd be, I'd be doing something, <laughs> a, bit, I'd be doing, I'd be doing something <laughs> a bit silly with my money. And I just wonder, was there a moment, you know, like, you, you know, there's a moment where mm. you go, oh, my God, this is massive, and mm. you get that first big paycheck. Mm. Do you spend it on something a little bit ridiculous, or were you kind of doing the Stormzy thing and buying your mum a house and all yeah, that? Yeah, no, I did that. Bought my mother a house. Did Paid the mortgage off first. Yeah. That was the first one. Brilliant. Um, uh, did I get I think I might have got my mother a car. She was driving, like, a Deo something, <laughs> and uh, I got her a car. Um Things like that, yeah. Sort There's of something out. in me as a son that just makes me want to do that. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like being able to offer, it's like such a good yeah. thank you. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Pay I mean, it back. I, well, yeah. Literally brought, dragged me up. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I was brought up. I wasn't dragged up. Um, but you know, being able to do that stuff is class. Like coming from a small working class town, knowing how tough it is to raise families and stuff like that. Um, and then being able to like do stuff like that is pretty sweet. Mm. Then, you know, there was... I was able to get myself in a flat and like, I always like, I feel like such a prick. I, like my, people ask me like, what was the first car you had? I was like, ah, oh, do I have to tell you? Yeah, you do <laughs> I, now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like, I literally, I got a Range Rover from my first car. Yes. Um, Color, what, like white, yeah, gold? No, it was black and I had it fucking matted. <laughs> yeah. And I was rolling around <laughs> London, like just, <laughs> yeah. this guy. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but like six by nines in the back. Yeah, oh buffer. yeah, we yeah. were all and big on twenty twos, baby. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was just like it's such a, and I, it was. It's not so much I'm gonna splash the cash. No, but it's like, no. Well, I have like a you know I was brought up well. You know we got we're we've done all right with the money thing, and you know I'm gonna get myself a car. Yeah, I, I, I can, and you've earned it. I'm going to learn how to drive here. And <laughs> in this car. Yeah, I'm going to learn how to drive. Yeah, and the then, insurance no, I got, on did that. me, did me uh, test in Barnet, in, you know, oh, yeah. High Barnet, whatever. Yeah, yeah. There's a testing centre up there. Some Irish fella taught me how to drive, which sounded dodgy enough already. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, and I remember I never did a manual test. Right. I did an automatic yeah, test because yeah. I noticed that all the cars that, like, you can, you can get every car in automatic. I was mm. like, why would I put myself through that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, knew I, to, I think I knew how to drive a half drive a tractor, um, <laughs> but in, but yeah. Then I just started. I never did a manual test. Did the automatic. Yeah, and so I got myself a car. Was able to get myself a flat, and yeah, and they were kind of my big spends. You were talking about um, that show in, in Bogota, mm. and I saw you guys uh, play. It was um, 
It was the BBC Music Awards, so it was, you know, it was one of, it was like loads of different- NEC. Yeah, 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 loads of different artists. Um, you know, I think he did one song maybe. Mm. And- Coldplay, I remember. Yeah, mm. in, the, in the crowd, at the mention of the name, One Direction, mm. right? And obviously every other artist was a bit of applause. And you, yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> which you know about. Um, <laughs> And then your name gets mentioned, and the sound that the crowd created mm. is unlike anything I've heard yeah. anywhere else. Mm. It was the, I, the, it's so hard to describe. It's like visceral. You know? yeah, it's like this yeah. instinctive thing. Mm. And I just wonder, as you know, a young man. I'm deaf now. <laughs> <laughs> even though you've been doing well pretending to hear me. Um, as a young man, you walk on stage. There's fifty thousand Colombians. Yeah. And I imagine the noise was more extreme than there was the BBC Music Awards, which is a bit more sedate affair. Yeah. How does it feel to hear that noise when you, and it's directed at you? Do you know what I mean? You know, I've like I've never. I'm one of these people that I've never ever gotten bored of like the feeling. Some people are like, I could do without touring. I could go home. You know, I'm, touring's not for me. But I've I've been always been I've always been excited for every show. Like what you're gonna get the the tension, the, the fact that people have waited and paid like mad money to come and watch it. I've like live off that um and that, that when when whatever the start of the show may be when that starts and the lights go down or whatever hearing that sound is just like there was there was talk of it being like the sound the same sound as if you were to set off if a nasa were to launch a rocket in the middle of the stadium is what well like the, the decibel decibels. level is the same noise <laughs> as like fucking soyuz or something like um <laughs> So yeah, there was talk of that at a few gigs. It's probably more so in South America. Very loud for the passionate, the passionate country. You know? <laughs> um, but yeah, that that feeling is just like it's go it's goose pimples every time. I bet um, you can't get, if you get bored of that. There's something wrong with you. How do you stay calm? You're you're in the wings. Mm. That happens. You just look at each other and just laugh. <laughs> like we would like there was so many we actually called one of our stadium tours where we are tour because we, because we would just be all the time just going look where we are. Yeah, like we literally be just going. What is this? This is mental. Um, yeah, so we it was it was a laughable offense. What was going on? Mm. Like there was you couldn't you know if you laugh if you didn't laugh you cry. Yeah, that phrase you know. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of times where we just stand there, just going, "What the fuck is going on? <laughs> this is how did we manage this?" It's insane. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so you're to come from coming at it from a sort of you know ego perspective, right? Mm. You've got. That noise every time you walk out on stage, you've got people queuing for days, you know, to get yeah. into your gig. I think you still got that now. I was reading a review from one of your earlier earlier um, shows in The Guardian, I think it interviewed people who had been there for two days, right, waiting for you so they could be at the front. Mm. You've got all this going on. And again, I keep coming back to how young you were at this mm. time. How did you stay level-headed? How did you How did you try and keep your ego in check? You, you seem so normal now talking to you and it's just yeah. it's extraordinary I don't know okay, I do get that but I don't know I don't really know how yeah um, I suppose like having good people around I was actually asked about this a couple of days ago I, I, the answer is probably the people around like the, the managers the, the label the, just the people we had in our team our tour managers are, are important our security are important people like that are very important um, to things like that and then it's, I'd say more than most likely our background, mm. like the way we were brought up. It, I think that was half the attraction of One Direction was that people could clearly tell it was five working class young lads from market towns and villages all over the UK and Ireland. And they were just like deer in the headlights, pop stars, you know. I think that was what a lot of people were attracted to. Um, and you just have to... We just kept just going along with it, seeing what had happened, and not because we. It's probably because we had each other. I think there's that thing of being able to keep each other in check. But I can't remember any situations of anyone being like over their yeah, station yeah. or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, if that's even a phrase. Yes. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Pro I'd say more, most likely down to our to our upbringings. I'd imagine mm. brought up, not dragged up. <laughs> <laughs> Was there anyone? Anyone in particular, I don't know, who was able to guide you, whether it was, uh, you know, another another artist mm. or maybe a particular manager or someone in your security that, you know, in, let's say, in a particularly stressful situation or whatever, you would be able to go to and be able to give you a bit of advice and give you a bit of a steer on how you should handle something. 
Because, you know, at my when I was that age, I'd go and talk to one of my parents about it. And yeah, yeah. You're on the other side of the world. Right? Yeah, yeah. There, there was that. The parents were helpful, though, because you'd just have normal conversation. Yeah. And they were blown away by it, too. So they're, they're, the fact that they were all blown away, it was like, oh, talk to my granny. And she's like, oh, I just cut your 95,000 picture out of the paper. You know, like, <laughs> you still had that. And it was still, you know, it was exciting to hear that. So that brings you down to heart straight away when you hear that kind of thing and mm. um the parents situation was always good because it was like very simple conversation nothing very irish oh did you hear who died this week in mullingar like you know like that's the kind of thing that i shouldn't be laughing at yeah that. i know that's but rude. that's the kind of that's where the conversation starts most of the time <laughs> um but yeah I, I think it was just the simplicity of the conversation and like i remember like my father and my mother saying like you know we've got no idea about this industry at all you know you already know more about that like now and mm. but you know just stay stay grounded don't let it, you get ahead of yourself or anything like that and you know because i think you're you're you probably spend your whole career in no matter what it is you're trying to like you're nearly holding on like as if it's on its way out yeah. you know you're like you're that's the way we kind of we we think as people it's, it's it's human nature to either get ahead of yourself and it falls flat on its face or you like or grabbing on like yeah. it's like it's going and it's probably not <laughs> um but yeah there's there's a bit of that that keeps you humble like we were, we were when we were doing stadiums back in the day and even now when i'm like playing arenas and things like that it could be very easily gone like there's another young you know another <laughs> there's a, some young sexy fella coming up here now just like <laughs> impossible <laughs> impossible you know and you have to think about what's coming and <laughs> how competitive it is out there and if you you know, there's thoughts that go through your head, you know, mm -hmm. um, that keep you humble. Anyway, did it change? Has your success, maybe not with your parents, but I was in, I was listening to an interview. I think it might have been Wan Bissaka or someone like mm -hmm. that, and he was he was talking about when he got his first team debut when he when he was starting for the first time, mm -hmm. and one of the senior pros said to him, "This weekend you're going to get a lot of people reaching out to you. Yeah. You're going to get a lot of people being like, oh, let's go for a drink, let's do this, mm -hmm. do that." And he's like, "Don't." Stay yourself, like stay within your zone, stay with the people that matter to mm -hmm. you. How did it change from that perspective, your relationships with other people? How did success change that part of you, that part of your life? Yeah, there, it's, there were definitely some strange ones. Not that I could particularly put my finger on, you just get a feeling. Mm. Um, like people that you went to school with that you barely spoke to, you know, that would, wouldn't even look at you in the hallway or now pretending to... Like, or kick, kicking the shit out of you. Yeah, yeah or like <laughs> spinning your around with your bag on your back and <laughs> like, you know, doing a bit of all that stuff. You remember when we were at that house party and remember? I was like, no, I don't, I really know. Um, I was 15, 16. Um, uh, a lot of that. And then like, yeah, you like, like family asking you to get like autographs signed and tickets for this person and videos for that person's nephews cousins you know that, mm. that kind of stuff but that's kind of slowed down a lot i think the excitement of you know it all was a bit much for everyone um they're mm. definitely like there are definitely like relationships that are yeah silently fractured without you know when you're when you are in that that level of, I guess, fame, right? This sounds like a stupidly broad question, but like, what happens? What, like, what is in the terms of like the details of your life? What changes? You know, have you got someone who is like a PA or whatever mm. who is really there for any need you have? They help you out. Is it mm. like body doubles going out of different entrances no, to I've hotels? Done all of that, yeah. You've done all that. I've done decoyed like, vans and yeah. So how does it change like the the logistics of your life? Because I'm assuming now. I don't know. Do you are you able to sort of like walk and go and get a pint of milk or go for a pint and yeah. all that kind of stuff? Like, what what changes for someone who hasn't experienced it? What yeah, I think the height of one D. I in hindsight, I probably could have gone more places, but the fear of going somewhere and getting pictures and autographs every step because there was periods where you'd go out and you wouldn't get five yards outside the door and it'd be cars pulling over on the street and countryside or. You go into the pub and everyone is looking at you or anything. I remember one time I went to, stupidly went to Westfield in Shepherd's Bush and honestly swore to God, I was like, I'm going to die in here. <laughs> I'm never getting out of here. <laughs> Outside, There's more people coming yeah. into Westfield. They're swarming. <laughs> it, was like Sean the, it was like Sean of the Dead or something. Um, but yeah, no, I remember like, it was the f probably the fear of that kept me in and I probably... 
be, probably became a bit of a recluse in ways. Early doors, probably I'd say 2012, 13, that kind of wor- world. Um, 14 maybe as well, where it was just kind of, yeah, the f- it, yeah, it was probably all in my head. Uh, like, became a recluse because of the, the thought of going out <laughs> when I probably could have. Because in hindsight now, I'm able to, I literally live the most normal, like, life that I could possibly live in in the, ca- in the scenario I'm in. Mm. You know, I, like, do my, like, I could go, I know this is sounding stupid because there was a period where I couldn't do any of this, but go to the shops and buy my own stuff and make my own dinner and, do you know, do the washing when I need to and... The, you know, just general stuff. Like, I'm, there was a period where if someone said to me, do you want to grab a coffee or do you want to go for lunch? I would have said, absolutely not. Mm. And now, like, you know, was I right to have been so quiet and reclused? You know, uh, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Um, but yeah, I tried, I do try. I have an assistant, like, you know, with, uh, helps me with day-to-day stuff, calendar management, yeah, yeah. house things, you know. <laughs> general stuff um, and that's very helpful obviously because I'm on the move all the time and you know be disaster if I just locked turned the key in the house and that was it um, <laughs> I come back to a pit <laughs> of <laughs> the dust um, but yeah no like that's that kind of thing's great and I used to like have security every single where every single place I went and it you know there'd be someone standing there all the time mm. and I just was like I don't need it that like, almost I can de- like-, like I grew up and went I can actually deal with this myself. Mm. <laughs> you know, I can like yeah. if someone comes up to me and asks for a photo, or and a few people do. It's just like, yep, just like you know, you but get used to things. Most most people are decent, right? Like most people mm. just want to like say hello to you a lot of the time, mm. I guess. And I would, I just like to the word you use there, fear. Mm. That's a really powerful word yeah. to talk about something that I think a lot of people would just immediately think, well. What's, what's to complain about? You know, yeah, it's like yeah. it's such a good thing. But mm. to you to use that word, it's clearly like a really deep feeling that you had at the time, and yeah. it kind of like you were saying, it's also self fulfilling. You know, you, mm. because you're scared, you don't go out. You don't go out because you're scared, and then you're just yeah, spiraling. It's snowball, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. It is. It's a. I don't know. I don't know what I was fear like when I, when I think about. It, it's like what was I fearful about? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, there is that like, and people are they're okay. Like that's fine if they have that view, you know. Yeah, you're rich and famous, and that yeah, must be brilliant, you know. But there is a side of it when you've just come from zero to uh, zero to hero for the one of a better <laughs> phrase, um, you know. The shock of it, mm. you know, one day you're not, and then you are, then the next day, and it's just like a bit, it's a bit of a shock to the system, and you just kind of you're trying to be as live a normal life, and the stuff that comes with it is a bit of like oh. I wasn't expecting this. Um, mm. um, yeah, there's just it's there are human feelings, but and p- fair enough, people have that view or whatever. But I've lived it, and I, I just kind of know what it's. Obviously, there are great perks as to what I do, but there was a couple of times where I was a bit not all the time, by the way. I sound like I was like depressed in what I was doing. I wasn't. I was loving it, but a couple of little things that I would have loved to have would yeah would have loved to have done different. Maybe did you? I was, did you grow up at all during this time? And I don't yeah. mean that to sound know, as like yeah. rude as it does. I mean it sincerely because simultaneously you're talking about the kind of the machinery that surrounds you at that time, mm. right? And as a 16, 17, 18 year old guy, I I think of myself, mm. right? I made mistakes. Yeah, I made a lot of mistakes. Mm. I got to make them in private. Mm. I didn't have the glare of the Daily Mail mm. pointing at me. I didn't have all of these people around me, like this apparatus to, mm. that exists, I guess to insulate you in a way, but also, like you said, to sort of take care of you, help you, assist you with all the stuff that's going on. So what did that mean for you and your kind of, yeah, development and like growing up? Yeah, it was a ver- obviously a very different, up, like very different formative years to most people. Um, there was a, there was a, we were in a bubble and we were just, the circus was going into towns and leaving it and there was people around doing stuff. We just probably had to grow up quicker. Like, as you said, you probably got to make some of your mistakes in private. I don't know if I made a ton of mistakes, but if I did, I did them publicly, probably. Um, And that's a very different thing for a 17, 18-year-old to to deal with. Um, I've always been a bit carefree and just kind of gone with it. Mm. With, every, with everything, 
to be honest with you. I get that vibe from you. Yeah, yeah I just like, well, I'm not a bad, I'm not a bad person, I don't think. Uh, I might have made a few mistakes, fair enough, and that's that, and we all do that. Um, and I could live with that and just go and plodding along, taking every day as it comes. But yeah, probably subconsciously, because of the, the shielding and that we had to do, you know, in our lives, if we wanted any sort of privacy, it probably matured you in a way that you didn't realize. Um, and probably, uh, probably some parts of my emotions or whatever probably got left behind for a couple of years and I'm probably catching up still. I don't know. We yet mm. to find out. This is Ollie, my therapist. <laughs> <laughs> We're going deep. We're going deep, man. Wait um, to see us in the pub in about an hour. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's my, ther my therapy is yeah. just, you know, uh, an over-reliance on alcohol as like an emotional crutch instead of actually dealing with any of the shit in my head. Um, <laughs> um, okay. So let, let's move on then. The actual moment, you know, uh, 1D comes to an end. Mm. When did you realise that it was over? Uh, there was a chat about a year out. Maybe less, actually, probably less. And it was just like, right, after this run, we'll just take it easy for a bit. Um, we were all, like, as I said, there was so much done in a short period of time. And people always used to say, well, you're young. You can do it. You know, you're spring chickens. Mm. Well, uh, for anyone, that's intense. You know, such a life shift, so much going on on a different level. Um, yeah, so that, I think it was just kind of like, right, let's, let's slow down for a sec. You described it as, I've seen you describe it in the past, mm. as a madness or as madness. Mm. So what comes after madness? Is there is there a calm after the storm? Like, how did you spend the time immediately afterwards? Straight away, we finished in December and I was in Australia on January the 2nd. A uh, cousin of mine was living down there and he was leaving. He spent five or six years down there. It was December 31st, wasn't it, your last show? So December, probably mid-December. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think, oh, yeah, yeah. No, it was mid-December, I think it was. And then it was like home for Christmas. And then I cousin was leaving. He was living in Australia for five years in Melbourne. And he was leaving to move back. And he literally packed up his bag. He sold his golf club, sold his bed, sold his blah, blah, blah. And packed his whole life into one bag after five years and then we met him in Australia and then we went up through Southeast Asia just the four, three of us and just stayed in dump hotels and hostels and just had a great laugh it was brilliant such a good laugh you found yourself I found myself yeah it was uh, <laughs> it was deep man show you my tattoos there right? <laughs> really deep um okay so what was it like performing for the first time yeah by yourself. Strange, yeah. I remember the first thing I did was, I think the first thing I did was Graham Norton. And I just remember like sitting in the dressing room and usually there'd be like a period where someone's out smoking a cigarette, someone's gone to the toilet two seconds before we go on stage. We're now late. So I just sit in the couch and wait for it. And I remember going, I'm not waiting for anyone. I could go on my own time. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I remember that, that being the, the feeling. <laughs> you know, when they call you, they're like, oh, five minutes, lads. You're like, well, he's in the toilet. He's out the back door smoking a cigarette. You know, we're just, we'll just give me, we'll wait. Um, so I remember that being the thing and then getting to stage and just looking around and there's less people. But apart from that, I just always trust myself as like a performer. So I just had to go and do it. But um, definitely different. I wouldn't say strange. I wouldn't say... Just a, diff a different experience, not really comparable. As as a man of the same age, in fact, it turns out the exact same age as you. We have shut we up. We're born on the same day. What? Yeah, I know. There's 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 multiple parallels happening here. I know. Small world. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. Thirteenth September. Yeah, man. Ninety three. Ninety three. Yeah. Shut I know. your <laughs> mouth. Yeah. I don't. What what time were you born? Eight a.m. Seven a.m. Oh. An yeah. hour older, my guy. <laughs> Sorry, I've just grown about a couple of inches. There. That is. Not crazy. I've never met it? anyone. That's mad from it? the thirteenth. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so what? What I was. We'll, we'll, You've got a much stronger beard than I'd ever be able to pull off. Fair play you're, to you. you're laying it on thick, Nile. Thank you. <laughs> I, appreci I, I appreciate it. Um, but what I was, what I was going to say was, mate. Like, I, I think about myself and how I conceive of myself in my career, and I think I'm 29. I reckon my peak is in my future, mm -hmm. and in your situation, reaching the heights that you reached mm -hmm. in one direction, to then go solo and kind of be standing on that cliff. Mm. I just imagine the pressure, and that can either manifest itself mm. as a really heavy pressure, or possibly also as an anxiety. Mm. And I, to hear you describe you playing for the first time like that, mm. 
th- I, I would have thought there'd be this, you know, crazy burden on your shoulders. I don't know. I think if the song was shite, I would have been a bit more nervous. <laughs> and <laughs> that's the God's honest yourself. truth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember writing it going, all right, this this will do for now. <laughs> this might get me somewhere. Um, it's, a lot, it's a lot easier to stand up on a stage when you've written a good one. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, I think so, anyway. Um, but no, I, there definitely was like, a, I just had to trust in what I thought I was good at, which is writing tunes and performing. And I felt like I could just keep doing it. Luckily enough, I had the fan base there. Mm. So I knew I wasn't walking into a dark room. You know, it was... It was going to be somewhat, you know, strong. And then, I've, thankfully, I've, I've had a couple of songs that have done well, and you know, I've been able to play some amazing, do some amazing stuff. But there was definitely a period of like, geez, I need, to, I need to get it right first time around. There's no, there's probably no yeah. second go at this. You know, I'll just be forgotten about. <laughs> but um, I didn't think about that too much, to be honest. That would have been a very easy hole to fall into. So why know, I am nothing without this, you know, like I just, I do need, I just trust in myself. Why do, so why do you think you didn't fall into that hole then? Where, like, where's that, I guess you'd say self-belief, but obviously you've been incredibly successful. So I, you, you would, you would believe in yourself, right? I guess. But. Yeah, I don't know. You gotta really put your finger on it. You can just roll with the punches and I trusted that I had a decent album and I worked with similar people and I knew what I wanted to write about and it was all kind of there in front of me and it was just, I had to just kick the ball into the goal. Um, Thankfully, I did, and the, the fan base is a massive part of that. Mm. Like being able to go around the world, you know, is helpful. It's awesome. <laughs> it's cool, you know. It is. It's it's amazing that you know I can go most places in the world and play a gig. It's f- like it's just it's phenomenal. I'm really so lucky. I am. But having that, knowing that, helps. You know, like as I said, I'm not walking into a dark room. People will listen. I just it's now about gathering momentum and still doing that to be honest with you it's still like three albums in mm. uh, and a pandemic later um <laughs> you know i still you're still trying always it's so competitive out there you're competing again i i'm just really competitive with myself about writing the next best song and then there's the, the you know the other singers that are out there competing with you and you're trying to you know and your old bandmates, I guess. Yeah, and then and then boys as well. But we don't, there's no like we're very good at that. We're not like because if we all made the same type of music, then maybe mm. I'd say there would be like a silent kind of you know dig here and there. But now nah, we're very good with each other. It's like, yeah. Have you watched um, Capaldi's Netflix doc? No, I haven't got around to it yet, actually. Um, but I'm also very good no, friends with him yeah. and aware of what he's gone through right yeah. so yeah okay I, what I'm coming at it from is yeah. I've watched an hour and a half of Netflix you actually have being his friend so <laughs> so you've got a much better idea of what I'm about to talk about yeah. than I do but I, I was watching that and th- I just you know his extraordinary success mm. and the way it kind of manifests and then morphs into this in- incredibly heavy burden mm. and the pressure it put him under and I wonder what the maybe the maybe not the point of difference maybe there is a point of difference between the two of you I don't know but the way you've re- handled that pressure why is it different and then I guess because you're mates if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit yeah. about how you've kind of helped him and spoken to him about I guess your experience and how maybe that can inform how he's yeah. dealing with it yeah I think there are similarities two working class lads two Celtic boys mm. you know spring to fame like Michael Richards once said <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? Uh, what did he say? And Roy Keane said to him, uh, "What was his line? Um, a shot, shot, uh, shot onto the scene, or something, yeah, like, something that. like that." Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, but you know what I mean. Um, so yeah, no, the, there are a lot of similarities. Did you see Roy Keane just saying "baby" the other day? No, <laughs> I can't remember who it was. It was a player. This player, so he goes, "He's just a baby." Is that, he's a, just, he's just a baby. He's and just then a baby. Th- there's a pause, and he goes. Baby, and they all like collapsed in laughter. It was, it was unreal, absolutely Such unreal. A nonsense, yeah. it's a baby. Um, no, there are definitely similarities myself and Capaldi. Like, the second I met him, we were just straight in, like, good mates. Like, I, I don't have a lot of, I don't particularly want any, but fa- there's a lot of, you know, I think a lot of people think that fa- famous people are all friends with famous people, not necessarily the case. There's a lot of our souls around there too. Um, and me and Cavalli just happened to get on very well the minute we met and similar taste in music, like a few pints, have a bit of a laugh and we get on very well. Um, and we'll have that similarity where we just kind of 
it happened very fast for him. Like one minute he's, mm. you know, just throwing a couple of YouTube videos and then he's playing arenas. Or just went to watch him in Atlanta, Georgia last week. Like he's now he's an international star of his own. Um, and that happened very quick for him um, with great music. So there we've ha- we've definitely have that in common. Like I spoke to him the other day. I, he was in tour in Toronto and we were just shooting the shit and talking about like what it's like in the road and how long he's got left and how he's enjoying the shows and we chat about that kind of stuff and then we've had some darker conversations too obviously because that's what friends do um, but I've always like felt like I've been there for him he asked, used to ask me like questions early on about this and that and and I'd just help wherever I could but I can't that's his his anxieties and his um Mental health is something I obviously can't control, but I'll be there to calm him if I can. Oh, he's obviously got great parents, as you can see, and they're just brilliant with him and all his mates, and he's got good folk around him. And um, yeah, we just we just have, we do have a lot in common, and I can help him wherever I can. I'm not I'm no genius either. There's no there's no book for it, really, is there? But you just have to. I know yeah, I know a, a little bit. Be a mate to him. Yeah. yeah. Do you think? I just picked up on that then. You talked about his friends from home, right? And they are just his, they're his mates, right? They're yeah. his mates from before he was famous. Yeah. Do you think there's there's something to be said for that about, I guess, being friends with normal people, mm-hmm. staying grounded, and also people who, just because, I, I guess, the pressure in your life, it can manifest in different ways. Maybe it's because you feel this pressure of success. Maybe it's pressure to pay your electricity bill. There's mm. commonality there. Mm. And actually staying in touch with not losing your mates because you think, oh, I'm better than them or whatever, mm. what a deluded thing some people get into their heads. Mm. But actually keeping that support network and fre- like friendship oh, yeah. circle can be so useful for you, for anyone from like a mental health perspective. Oh, like, there's no doubt. Yeah. In fact, like I, all of, I don't really have many new friends. I don't particularly need them or want them. <laughs> um, all of my mates are from home and like some lads have moved to London or whatever and we spend a bit of time there too. But all of my mates, my best mate, he moved to America for work and we live together still and since I, I've known him since I was four, went to, we went to primary school together. Um, like we're, I, yeah, it's just it, it happened that way, and I'm glad it does. You know, it's like it's 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 very important. I think you know they're off doing their jobs. Like one of Lewis's mates is like a grave digger, and his other mate works in finance, and the other fellow works in recruitment, and then my mates are um, you know working property and you know, just yeah like there's normal lads. just normal lads doing but it's all very relative like it's not like I'm going around going I don't pretend, pretend I don't tend to talk about work a lot in front of them to be honest because mm. like it's just you know most whatever. people don't I don't know like I yeah. there's that classic thing of like you get down oh you're all right yeah you're all right and yeah. then you're just like off talking yeah, about yeah, some yeah, absolutely yeah. nonsense <laughs> <laughs> nonsense thing you know what I mean literally by the way <laughs> it's like I'd, yeah I'd, a grave digger as well that's I'd love to I'd, you saying oh I don't need any friends I would love to become friends with a grave digger because yeah. that I'd just be fascinated by that man yeah, that's he's extraordinary a, he's a great lad as well but yeah, no, yeah. It, it, there's um, yeah I think it's it is important if it's not like if we've, I don't think it's not like we're like I'm trying to keep in touch with my you know my my old life it's not like that it's just that's the way it just is just doing my bit for the community yeah yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah you know I'm not trying to like keep myself down to earth by forcing relationships with old friends but no I definitely like mm-hmm. no nah, we're just that's just the way it is we've got, we're all still in the same in the, have the same interests and in sport and drinking and <laughs> 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 there are the commonalities always would you do it all again? What? If you had the choice. 16-year-old you. Yeah. Yeah. Says this is where you'll end up. Yeah. You get a choice. You can do it. You can't. You go somewhere else, some other way. Yeah. Oh, no, 100%. Yeah. I've had a very good experience of it. I'm sure there are, like, you hear horror stories, don't you? I've never really met anyone with, with a mad horror story, but you do hear horror stories of they weren't looked after or they fell into a hole or, you know, like this. But I, I just... Don't know whether it's a character thing or the way I was brought up or I don't know, but I just kind of I've just really loved all of it. I'm like, yeah, there's relative days where you're just a bit like oh, fuck this, but we all have that. Um, but I'm I, I love I just, I just love the the madness. I wouldn't change much at all. Actually, I wouldn't change a thing. Um, you learn from the mistakes and you go at it again and. I mean, the perks of what I do is just incredible. So I'm one of the lucky, the very lucky few over the decades 
to be able to do what we do. So, um, yeah, no complaints from me. I wouldn't change a thing. No, Horan, thank you so much. For taking You're a gentle, time. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Really appreciate it, mate. Thank you.